Ok, buenas, buenos días. Vamos a empezar con el último taller de hoy. Y bueno, nos vamos a autopresentar. <risa> es horrible. Eh, yo soy Jocely Miners y eh, soy profesora aquí en la Universidad de Texas en Austin, en el Departamento de Español y Portugués. Y Flavia. Ah, bueno, yo soy Flavia Belpoliti, ya me conocen muchos de ustedes. Uh, soy profesora de uh, lingüística hispánica en la Universidad Texas NAM en Commerce. Uh, y las dos uh, estamos juntas en TEX desde ya hace unos varios años. Y es un gusto realmente estar esta mañana con all of you. Um, y como una breve <ríe> nota, lo que estábamos hablando recién con algunos colegas, aparte, este, la decisión de la uh, Corte Suprema, si no lo han visto. Um, so, we can talk about that after, after we finish, but yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so today we are going to talk about OER in project-based curriculum, inclusion, engagement, and agency. So we, Flavia and I, have both been doing project-based teaching for many years, and I have to say that I got inspired to start to create my first project-based course after I saw her talk at a conference like eight years ago, yeah. <laughs> and something like that. And now, uh, you know, we're, yeah, we've both been working a lot with project-based learning and with Coral. OER, Open Pedagogy. So we're going to share a little bit about what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. No hay clicker, ¿verdad? No sirve el de ayer. I don't know. I don't know if this is working. Is this working? No. no. We'll just no. click here. Yeah. OK. Entonces, los objetivos para hoy. Primero, lo que queremos compartir es the main principles of project-based in language teaching and learning. We're going to talk about the main principles of open education in language teaching and learning. And we're going to analyze project-based implementations from open education perspectives so we can, at the end, plan and design a project-based unit of your own integrating OER for your own classes. That is our plan for today. Y entonces, para empezar, vamos a empezar con la primera actividad que tienen en el handout. Whether you have the paper or on, on our folder in the drive, That, the one that says cuadernillo de trabajo. Mm -hmm. And the first activity, it says in groups of three or four, please comment on the activity one, which is about a personal project. project. So there are some questions, so answer the question fast. With, with your partner or two people, we don't have very specific instructions. No, no, for we, this. Uh, like, um, I'm going to learn from Julia's instructions, but repeating. So what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Which activity? <laughs> Number one. one. Okay, And so just a few minutes to share activity one with a partner or a group. Primer ejercicio era para ponerlos a pensar en sus estudiantes, sus necesidades, lo que creen que les funcionaría, no les funcionaría. Entonces nos vamos a enfocar en la última pregunta, específicamente sobre project-based learning, que ¿Qué hablaron en sus grupos? ¿Qué beneficios tendría? ¿Qué dificultades creen que a sus estudiantes les gustaría? ¿Por qué sí? ¿Por qué no? ¿O qué experiencia tienen? Lo que quieran compartir. Sí, muy bien. Gracias por compartir. Y bueno, hablando de los beneficios, ¿verdad? De, de, hay, obviamente hay challenges también, pero de los beneficios de Project Based Learning es eso, que podemos escoger temas que les interesen a ellos. Ellos mismos escogen los temas de sus proyectos y entonces uh -huh. ahí vamos. Ok, vamos a seguir. Yeah, este, okay. Flavia. So we're going to do like very fast uh, core concepts and we can keep talking about this for a long time, but the idea is to have like the very clear uh, conceptualization of these, of these concepts. And something that happened to me is that I hear phrases like project-based or tax-based or even activities And sometimes it's kind of a confusing uh, concept or idea. And I think that it's important if we're going to work with a particular uh, curriculum model that we have very clear the, the expectation for that. So this is the uh, traditional and uh, maybe the most clear uh, definition of what project-based instruction is, regardless the topic. It could be languages or it could be any other uh, subject. So I just bolded the uh, words that I think are really relevant for our purposes. So it has to be engaging. That's the first thing, and it has to be active. Second, it has to be meaningful. 
defer extended period of time. I mean, we cannot talk about projects and think, oh, I will have just one week for this. No, projects are at least six, seven weeks, a full semester, a full year, depending on, on the scale of your project. Uh, there has to be with something that connects with the real world, and it has to be answering and trying to solve a complex, challenging question, and that's probably the, 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 the first step that you will be thinking about. And then there has to be a public product, and this is something that I notice is, is like a failure in the implementation because it's stay in the class. If it stays in the class, it's not a real project-based uh, model, okay? Mm -hmm. So you have to be thinking of a public product, and it could be like an, a small public or audience. It could be just, you know, classmates from another class. It could be professor from another uh, department. It could be just the university, the, the high school, their parents, but it has to be outside the classroom itself. And finally, you are expecting to have a real audience uh, at some point for that product. And those are the core approaches, as you can see, are interconnected and anything can be moved around, but basically you are expecting to have students to get into deep inquiry and develop critical thinking about uh, a particular topic, authentic materials, authentic results, agency, they have a voice and they have to choose different things. They have to learn to collaborate at certain point of the project. They have to be able to do revisions and critique and become very proficient in revising their own work and the work of their classmates. And it has to have a stage for reflection. So those are core components. And when you are designing your project model, I think that it's very good to have the list nearby and, and keep working. Okay, what happens with uh, language learning and project base? And our colleagues, because I mean, they are also another national <laughs> foreign language research center, but in Hawaii, uh, <laughs> and they're conducting some workshops uh, on summer, so you can see the information there. Uh, they are the, the ones that are being involved in project-based language learning the most. And again, they see as a very good approach for language learners competency in foreign languages, but also in heritage languages. And you can see that the 21st century skills that Axel also promotes are included here. Critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, intercultural communication, and so on. And based on research, starting very early in the 90s, up to basically now, we can see different uh, studies that have found these very good benefits for language learners. Uh, so everything that we saw in the previous slide is interconnected with the development of language competence, but also intercultural communication competence. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one. So I'm thinking what Elena said as well, and that's something that has been uh, evolving in our field. There are also additional benefits for heritage language learners, Spanish or other heritage languages. Uh, they allow the students to basically display their linguistic abilities and intercultural abilities, like the full repertoire. Uh, supports differentiation with projects, you can adapt the project to different levels according to your students. They normally feel more confident and they feel that they can do this and have a nice product that they can showcase. And of course, you want to increase confidence. That's one of the goals that we have. Uh, increased endolinguistic pride, and particularly when they share it with their own community, family, friends, uh, they feel, oh, my parents were so proud that I showcased this poster, for instance. Um, they can be a way to start exploring and discussing very complex issues. And sometimes I was thinking about our presentation yesterday, particularly the anti-discrimination language and what we know about that. Uh, sometimes it's difficult with certain students to start talking about these hard topics. And I think that a small project that it targets that can really help us on the discussion. And reinforced ties, depending on the project, that can really, really tie up with their own or communities and become more involved. Okay, thinking about this particular set of benefits that have been uh, already kind of listed by, by different researchers, what will be the benefit that you will prioritize in your project and why? 
And you maybe have, you can think of other benefits yeah, too. Yeah, of course, of course, you can, you can add to the list. Two minutes, three minutes with your um, elbow partner, I like the phrase, <laughs> elbow <Yeah>. partner. <laughs> so, Yo nunca había escuchado you. eso No, no, tampoco. gracias, Julia, elbow partner. <laughs> Bueno, ¿cuáles creen que son algunos beneficios? Which ones would you prioritize or did you think of new ones? Entonces, ok, muy bien. Um, ok, entonces ahorita vamos a hablar un poquito sobre el concepto de open educational practices and open pedagogy. So yesterday we had a really great introduction to OER from Carl and so we're going to keep going further and talk about not just the resources, but the practices. So OER shifts the focus, OEP shifts the focus from OER to resources to practices. Okay, so it's not just having a resource, but how do I practice open education? And so what we can do with students is to engage them in participatory pedagogies to create OERs themselves, the students themselves. And, um, this concept of open pedagogy emerged as a demonstration of these practices within the context of teaching and learning. And this is important, while engaging in renewable assignments instead of disposable ones. So I want to pause here and talk a little bit about what this means. What do you think are examples of renewable versus disposable assignments? Example, como la basura, ¿no? Que se puede volver a usar y que no. Entonces, ¿cuál sería un ejemplo de un Disposable assignment, desechable. Mm -hmm. They write a paper, you grade it, you give it back, and they don't even look at your comments, they put it in the recycle. <laughs> Hopefully not the trash, the recycle, <laughs> right? So, so that would be a um, disposable, no? Assignment. ¿Qué sería un renewable assignment? A podcast, because, is that who said podcast? Of course, Elena said podcast, because if you don't know, Elena has an amazing podcast that she has, I don't know how many hundreds of episodes now recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Ohio Habla. <laughs> oh, okay, se llama Ohio Habla, but now she's a, porque ahora este Hannah además está en, yeah. sí. <laughs> but that's a great example. If students, they create as a project, a podcast, it's not just for them, for the class, for the grade, para que lo escuche la profesora y les dé una nota, is to share with the community, right? It's a renewable because you keep using it for different purposes. ¿Cuál sería otro ejemplo? Another example. Your presentation yesterday, Emily, now that you raised your hand, had, they're all renewable, the translations. Okay, we're going to keep going and talk more about open pedagogy. So why, why is this useful? So um, one of the interesting things, it's, it's this idea of open pedagogy makes you the teacher. There's a transformation. You're not um, just feeding the students information, right? It empowers the students, the learners, to produce and curate knowledge themselves, right? And it shifts the teacher role to that of facilitator more than instructor, right? So it balances the power of knowledge between student and instructor. And it pr promotes this participat participatory culture and builds trust among contributors <coughs> because everybody's you know, working together on this project. And it also seeks to improve teaching and learning by empowering the students as educators and educators as agents of knowledge production. So empowering and production are the <coughs> two main things here. We have uh, this really great um, image of kind of what every, everything that open pedagogy entails. And so why in our heritage Spanish classrooms? So now we're going to go back to our own classes, what we thought about at the very beginning of our talk, and what we need, what our students need. And so we talked about learning empowerment, right, which is really important in our courses. We all always talk about empowering our students. And the last bullet says, empowering students is at the heart of all of our heritage Spanish courses. And also open pedagogy has the ability to optimize the full potential of learning. So students are creating and curating their own content and contributing to the public domain. So their own content because as we know heritage Spanish students come to our classrooms with already a wealth of cultural knowledge and they really have the ability to create culturally and linguistically rich renewable content. So they themselves already have all this and they have access to the community that can also bring in a lot of 
wealth of knowledge. Okay, so I hope I convinced you now that this is a good, uh, something good to use with our students. So, Flavia, now we're going to talk about this. Yes, I think that, I mean, and you can see the connection between the maintenance of project base interconnected with open pedagogy. It really work, they work very well and it's very simple to kind of bring them together in your, in your designs. So, now what we want to do is to see some project based language learning implementations, particularly some that are done with heritage languages, Spanish, but also Portuguese. And the idea is, as a preparation for your own design, you're going to evaluate those uh, projects. So we have a large list. There are more than 10. You have to pick one and then work with your uh, small group. And there is a rubric in the handout, also in the handout online. And the idea is the activity two is an evaluation task. You're going to basically use the rubric to analyze that one of the projects. Okay. So basically we're giving you the final product of what the students created so you can kind of think backwards. How did they get here? Right? And analyze the project. The different different components, the different ideas, etc. So there's a folder in the mm -hmm. in our folder that says proyectos and that has some examples, but also here on the PowerPoint you just click on these the underlined ones or you have the URLs here. Click to go and see some of these projects. So very different, but I mean, all of them, they, they followed uh, so just TBA, that. some examples, yeah, for now. Que oh. vamos a, a volver a comentar un poquito. Más o menos la rúbrica pudieron uh, avanzar con la rúbrica. <laughs> bueno, por lo menos mirar algunos de los proyectos y pensar. Sí, sí. sí. Si tomamos ideas ya. Ajá. Si te quedas conversando del proyecto, bien. Pero eso es un lindo muestrario para que uh, lo tengan de referencia. So, mm -hmm. paso, yeah. So. Okay. So now we're going to show you like the step by step two different implementations. The one that uh, Joseli did with her students and one that I did with mine. So you have basically the the setup and the order of of the projects. So you have some information here for the essays that we did in our class. Uh, the project background was based on. Uh, photo essay that I found and I really like it and it was like okay this is a project that we can do we were in the middle of the pandemic everybody was at home in zoom and normally the first project for this class was a uh, scrapbook with uh, photos from their families and their places of origin and they have different activities and that time I say I'm going to change that I'm going to use the pandemic as, as, a, as a topic so basically, uh, at the same time, the university was collecting materials to create a kind of a reservoir of what was happening in North Texas at the time. So they were collecting data, interviews, uh, news, etc. And they were saying, OK, if there are materials from your classes, you can bring those to us. So I said, OK, they're going to publish in here, in this reservoir. And of course, we have uh, the COVID as a setup. Uh, this is the class. Uh, we have, uh, at the time, there were 15 students. The timeline was for the first five, six weeks. It was 40% of the final grade, which is, I think, that is important if you're in implement project base. The project became your first and main assignment. So it's going to be a big chunk of your, of your final grade. Uh, it was individual work. The individual product was made by each student, but it was collaborated in several uh, stages. We have the goals here, so some of the photos from the opening uh, pages, and uh, I follow um, um, a little bit of multiliteracy approach, but I think I divided in the initial content and then exploration, analysis, very similar to what we just saw with, uh, with Julia, which is very connected. Um, we work in organization, rhetorical, the place of photograph in, in photo essay, why is that important. We uh, revise several uh, photo essays from different very diverse topics. And the students were doing different activities at each time and having like particular products. Each product had a small part of the final grade for that project. Okay, so we have the first week, then the second week was this. Then we have the development with different, uh, we did like short workshops in class for different uh, aspects. 
like the writing, some of them have to do with editing images, have to do with using Sway because some students explore the use of Sway. Many just use PowerPoint, so they had a lot of choice in the, in the final format. And they have different uh, elements that they have to take in account. For instance, the release signature for the people that were in the photo, so they learn about that. Uh, the initial plan was to have only 10 photos in the final, but they were very enthusiastic and several essays had like 20 photographs or something like that. And they wrote a lot. I mean, I was expecting like a thousand words in the final product and it was, many of them were very, very long. They were very enthusiastic about that. They have to work in the photo selection with partners and they have to go with the revision with partners. So the collaboration was there. We use a lot of rubrics. I think they had like seven rubrics. And then the final product, the final essays, they present them to their own classmate in class. Then they share it with family, friends. Many of them just posted in their social media feeds. And then finally, we got the PDFs uh, for the Tamok Library, where they are part of the pandemic um, database. You can call it that. OK. Joseph. OK, so <clears throat> Flavia gave you a lot of details for, you know, you can see step by step everything she does for her project. And you, it's not just that one week, you know, there's, you have to spread it out. And so I'm going to share a little bit about a class that I taught using open pedagogy also. And it's a class that has, it's based on three projects, La Noticia, La Leyenda, y El Ensayo. And this comes from Delia's textbook, Avanzando, Delia Montesinos. And there's other components in the course, but the main yeah. elements are these three projects. And so I'm just going to describe one, which is La Noticia. It's a four-week project. And basically what the students do is they find an event from their, lo llamamos la comunidad histórica, o sea, algo que haya pasado en la historia en su comunidad, y la comunidad puede ser el campus, puede ser la, el pueblo, la ciudad, hasta el país donde, donde estamos. Y um, van a explorar la noticia, el evento, y ponerse como que ellos están en esa época, cuando está pasando el evento, ¿verdad? Y seleccionan el tema, investigan, tienen que leer, escribir un borrador de la noticia, se dan retroalimentación. Aquí les doy, <coughs> solo para que se den una idea de paso a paso, todo lo que hacemos, revisamos, luego en componente oral, donde en grupos comparten lo que aprendieron, la noticia, luego lo hacen un poco más formal, graban como un noticiero, como que es breaking news, this just happened, ¿verdad? Como un noticiero, es un registro formal, etcétera. Y luego escriben la noticia ilustrada para el periódico con una imagen. Y entonces aquí es donde entra la parte de Open Pedagogy, opcional, porque no podemos obligar a los estudiantes a compartir, compartir su trabajo y publicar y mostrarlo al mundo, ¿verdad? Pero opcional, no parte de la nota, crear un OER basado en el trabajo que han hecho, incluir la licencia Creative Commons, y para esto hay que explicarles a los estudiantes qué es, cómo funciona, cómo se hace, ¿verdad? No puedes simplemente decir, ok, ponle tú la licencia. Eh, al final siempre hay un, un paso de reflexión, pero eh, la idea es que los que quieran compartir esa noticia de los, todos los estudiantes que compartan, lo compilamos en un pequeño periódico, ¿verdad? Es como un periódico de nuestra comunidad que se puede usar para otros propósitos. Bueno, la idea es que sea un renewable assignment and we can use it for other purposes. Entonces, les voy a mostrar el producto final eh, de nuestro pequeño periódico que creamos, las noticias de nuestra comunidad. <coughs> y entonces, eh, un, aquí está solo la descripción, los, los artículos, ¿verdad? Todos los temas y los pusimos en orden cronológico. Algunos escogieron hablar de algo que pasó en 1947. Los últimos eran, acababan de verdad de pasar recientemente cuando enseñé la clase. Y cada estudiante escogió eh, una imagen que tenga eh, Creative Commons License, ¿verdad? Y cada estudiante escogió cuál licencia usar para compartir. Ven, este le puso CC BY, ¿verdad? Por ejemplo, este tiene otra restricción ahí. Um, pero cada uno tenía la autonomía de decidir qué licencia ponerle a su trabajo, ¿verdad? 
Ok, el otro proyecto, ustedes está, algunos lo estaban mirando, es el de las leyendas, que es el segundo que hacemos en la clase y en este lo que hacen es entrevistar a una persona de la comunidad hispana, normalmente su familia, pero no tiene que ser, que les cuenten una leyenda oralmente, porque las leyendas son tradición oral, ¿no? Y lo graban a la persona y luego escriben una versión de la leyenda. Y lo que hicimos aquí fue crear como un, digamos, un librito de leyendas digital de nuestra comunidad. Y el twist es que cada leyenda tiene un final nuevo. El estudiante, su parte que aporta creativamente es cambiarle el final, ¿verdad? Como una versión nueva de la leyenda. Y aquí está, entonces, eh, el ejemplo. Igual, tenían que usar las imágenes Creative Commons y la licencia que ellos quisieran, eh, basado en el costal de huesos, hay varios de la Llorona, el Callejón del Beso de Guanajuato, que es muy famoso, eh, de los volcanes en la Ciudad de México, es todo del Callejón, voy a buscar el de Marco, este es el de Marco. Ok, ahora voy a hablar sobre esta, porque aquí tenemos al autor, Marco Pevia. <risa> Y ese, él escribió sobre este, el hombre lobo que luchó. Y entonces vamos a pasar porque les voy a hablar más de Marco en un minuto. Pero primero, eh, si estoy aquí en el slideshow, ¿por qué se hizo así? ¿Cómo vuelvo a hacerlo? Ya, yeah. ok. Entonces vamos a seguir hablando un poquito sobre... Eh, esta pedagogía, Open Pedagogy, y cómo podemos usar esos Renewable Assignments, cómo se pueden usar. Entonces, we brainstormed, the students and I, about how other people could use our products that we created. So here are some ideas. It could be inspiration for other students to write their own noticias y leyendas. They could use it for reading comprehension to learn new vocabulary. They can build on the projects and extend to their own communities. Uh, they could compare and contrast some of the noticias because a couple students wrote about the same topic, for example. Or they could uh, use it as a base for creative writing, where they could create even new uh, endings to the leyendas. And so uh, our idea is those little booklets we created, they're just small projects. But in our text <coughs> website, the Heritage Spanish website, we, it's basically a repository of activities that are Creative Commons and that we share with the world. So we want to publish it there. But taking it one step further, Marco was in that class and he participated. And then um, this is a, voy a hablar mucho de ti, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> Model spotlight, student. spotlight. He's a heritage student who came in as a science major. And he took one of uh, Delia Montesinos, our first heritage class, and decided now he's a Spanish major. He's going to get a PhD in Spanish. Wow. And yes, he's on track. And, but, and he's a so, he just finished sophomore year, but he already presented a poster here with us. And so he came to me and said, I want to work more on this. What can I do? And so we brainstormed, and he is, Ben Marco, he's going to show you what he's been working on, which is extending on um, this project. He's going to show you he's creating activities that other instructors can use based on our work. Yes, so another thing, I'm also getting my, oh, oh no. Yeah, you teach, right? Estoy Sorry. tan nervioso. Está prendido. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I'm also getting my teaching certification. Ay, santo. Yeah, he's doing student teaching. He's getting his teaching certification. Yes, um, and so, I got inspiration. Um, I was this past semester. I was in a middle school class for seventh graders, um, Spanish one, and I loved that class. They were amazing, uh, two L's, and um, yeah, it was just great to see them. And so that being in that class gave me ideas for these lesson plans. And so con las noticias. So you click on there, from the Lisa. Aquí está un um, folder de. Let's let it. So this is what I created. Um, so this is basically like an outline of like where teachers can go to to find all the 
lesson plans that I did. So, la primera que hice es um, preguntas de comprensión y discusión. Um, so, I read every single leyenda, I read every single um, noticia, and made five questions um, for each one. So, like, ¿cuándo y dónde ocurrió la noticia? Uh, ¿Crees que esto es un caso influenció a casos diferentes? Um, so, yeah, each one builds upon each other one. So, the point of this one was to have it either, like, have the teachers write them down, and then the students can write them as a warm-up, or just put them in a, in a circle, have a Socratic seminar, a discussion, in any kind of way. Um, those are discussion questions. I also have, in, for AP Spanish, there's the... Unit five, which is factors that in, that impact the quality of life, you can you can add that into AP Spanish five. In analysis de vocabulario. So, um, en las noticias específicamente pueden haber palabras que los estudiantes no conocen o no pueden reconocer algo así. Y con esto, es, I got I got um, inspiration from profesoras minors a fiches de lectura. Um, <laughs> Which I got inspiration from Flavia. So it's all, it's all a yeah. big circle. Full it's all a big circle. circle. <laughs> so, um, so write the word that, that's desconocido, the definition in the dictionary, and then the word in your own, the definition in your own words, the translation in English, and then write an original sentence with that word in it. So it can definitely like get into your head what is that word and all these things. Un reflexión, and then escribir una noticia original. So basically, the exact project that we did, but I laid out the, the puzzles and how we did it. So basically, he's making lesson plans and even the worksheets that yes. instructors can use based on the noticias y leyendas. Yeah, and then basically the same thing for the leyendas. They're mostly the same. The only ones that maybe a little bit different would be... Um, so because they're... Told their their leyendas, their cuentos. A lot of it are, is told in the pasado. So there's an actividad of the comparing the pretérito and imperfecto. So I gave I brought out a sentence uh, from the leyendas. What is the verb? Is it in pretérito imperfecto? And then por qué? And but yeah, most of it's the same. But yeah, I had a lot of fun doing this. Oh, uh, the character profile that was really fun uh -huh. as well to do. I wish I would do these, but. <laughs> Escoger un personaje que le sobresalió, cómo se llama, de cuál leyenda es, qué hace la leyenda, just a, char a simple character profile. Y escribir un diálogo entre dos personajes de las leyendas o algo así, hiciste yes. también, creo. O sea, como más creativo. Ya, yeah, yeah. en el guión. Ajá. Uh -huh. Ya, yeah, en el, también no hay un guión original de personajes de leyendas. They can pick two people from different leyendas, the same leyenda. What would be a dialogue between the two characters, um, stuff like that, and then they can, like, outline this and then start their guion here. But yes, I think that's, every, I think that's everything. Gracias, Marco. So, so, so yeah, I think this is like a really fun example of how we can use our students' work and expand on it and share it with the world and other students, other teachers can use it. And so when I, when I we did this class, I surveyed the students and I asked them about their experience being in the class and doing this project using the Creative Commons licenses. Was it hard? Was it easy? I asked them, why did you share? Why did you decide you wanted to, et cetera? And I don't, I'm not giving you all the data because we don't have time, but just my main takeaways from that survey was that students really like the idea of contributing and helping other students. And all their answers, oh, I want to help, I want to help. And instructors should motivate students to really participate and provide we need to provide clear instructions and training on what OER and CC licenses are because once you do that, they get it. There's a short video on the Creative Commons website they can watch and then they understand and like, oh yeah, this makes sense and it's pretty simple, straightforward to do it. Uh, but really makes them feel empowered and think highly of their work. I really loved reading the responses because they said, oh yeah, this could be an example for other students. They really are seeing their own work as examples and models, and they like to share, right? So, and Marco, puedes decir lo que tú dijiste about the school you came from and why you decided to share your work? Like on the survey, you said something about that? Yeah. 
Entonces, ahora el tiempo que queda, Flavia. Ya. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Aquí se me está fine. It's, it's not 20, but it's close to that. Okay, so the last activity for you guys is to start planning a project for your classes. We provide the templates, two templates. We have a list of topics and designs or text, as you prefer to call them. And there is also the link to the reservoir that you can see other examples that you may find interesting. But we really want you to really start with this. And I will be sending an email a week from now asking for the final plannings, okay? <laughs> so this is not just disposable, uh, you have to do it today because they are asking, no? No, this is re renewable and I want really everybody to have the time to develop it. And you have different examples here, but I mean, part of the joy of project base is that you can be very, very creative, okay? So, um, okay, we have 15 minutes. So we are running out of time. I know you probably don't have time right now to create the whole project. But hopefully you guys have some ideas now about things you could do in your classes. Y hay una lista en el handout de ideas también que tal vez les pueda ayudar. Y hay mucho en la web para explorar de otros proyectos que han hecho otras clases. Y so we've always encouraged at these workshops for instructors to share their work. You know, it's everybody's creating materials, so why not share it? put a Creative Commons license and share it. But now we're taking it a step further and we're encouraging you to also encourage your students to share their work because they can also produce amazing things that others can use. So now when you design a project for a course, you can think about it not just in what are my students going to learn, but how can we also help the community or share with the community and make it renewable. Right. That's the goal. So we had, uh, maybe there's a couple minutes for comments, questions. And if, if, you, if there's something you can take that you will, like you were saying, concretely use in your class, then I think it's it made worth the trip to Austin, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Hmm? Nosotras, pues con esto concluimos nuestra presentación. Gracias.